Hello, everyone. I think we're all here. Are we? I'm here. Hi, everyone. Where are we? Hi, here? Ruth. Hi, Penny. Hi. How are you? Hi. Hi. Um, should we should we wait for a few more people to join, or should we start now? Up to you. You hold the wisdom here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll just start. I'll do a quick intro and then we can get going. So, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. We're very excited for Penny Rafferty and Ruth Catlow to be joining us for today's Wisdom Seed, hosted by Maria Paula. Um, if you haven't joined us before, Wisdoms for Neck Now is an expansive world-building project by the Artist Collective Kaken. And... Our Wisdom Seeds, of which this is one, are a series of conversations with leading thinkers and luminaries. Wisdom Seeds are the initial stage of this project. The wisdom from these seeds will be processed by GPT-4 and distilled into the source material for our Wisdom Vessel NFTs. Those NFTs will then produce a Wisdom Currency, which will be the first currency of Necknell. Um, so onto today's seeds. Penny Rafferty is an independent writer and thinker. Departing from her research and thinking, she's initiated and co-founded Black Swan Dow, a proto-institution for interdisciplinary research and practice. Ruth Catlow is an artist, researcher, curator, and co-director of Further Field. She leads award-winning experiments with blockchain and Web3 for fairer and more connected cultural ecologies and economies. And together... Penny and Ruth are the principal investigators at Serpentine Gallery's Blockchain Lab and the editors of Radical Friends, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations and the Arts, a collection of essays, interviews, exercises, and prototypes from leading thinkers, artists, and technologists across the fields of DAOs, NFTs, crypto art, Web3, and blockchain technology. Today's seed is hosted by Maria Paula Fernandez, co-founder of JPEG DAO, where she spends most of her time building cultural infrastructure for Web3's cultural objects. Um, so that's the introduction, and I'll hand it over to you, MP, to get started. Sure. sure. Thank you so much, Josh, for the introduction. And I have to say, oh, principal investigator sounds amazing. It sounds so mysterious <laughs> and like you're about to <laughs> go so, like... A mystery of life. Um, so I want to know everything about that. But I also prepared some questions for Ruth and Penny, who I've known for a while. So I hope my questions aren't um, too deep for our audience. I, I'm i hoping also that they're able to explain some of the stuff that we're going to discuss. Uh, because, you know, audience renew themselves all the time. And in Web3, um, there's new people coming in. Uh, very fast uh, all the time so it would be nice to record in as part of this wisdom um some context because context is wisdom after all um okay so cool welcome to this space that i have the honor of co-hosting -ho today um i'm very happy i've been uh, working with the netnel team as a netnel council member for some months and it's just a delight to see them uh, embark in this new world building experiment. It's also very interesting and very, very timely that uh, the NFTs are launching alongside um, a currency, an ERC-20 uh, called Wisdom because we're seeing a disaster of meme coins happening now. So I believe that Wisdom, which is not a meme coin, is actually a very well-constructed part of an incredible world, will bring some quiet, peace, quiet, and reflection to the, to the NFT space. Uh, but without further ado, um, hi, Penny. Hi, Ruth. Again, long time no see. Um, let's talk a little bit about your your backgrounds um i also would lo love to know you know what's what does being a principal investigator in, imply <laughs> you'll have to say who you would like to speak first because penny and i are both very polite and we might just have a lot of airtime silence <laughs> okay um who wants to start speaking <laughs> 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 okay i'll go i'll go and penny interrupt me 
Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the blockchain lab at the Serpentine is really a space for investigation and research into the kind of possibilities and hazards of life at the crossover of blockchain and art. And uh, Penny and I have been uh, working working out of the Serpentine, but also in our kind of like connecting up our own networks of artists, techies, activists, who have been kind of like basically mining and digging around and understanding what is interesting about uh, decentralized tech and decentralized kind of different ways of uh, working and doing creative practice. And so Penny and I working together at the Blockchain Lab have been uh, inviting our network communities to come and think through the philosophical, ethical, practical hazard, but kind of hazards and opportunities of work in the Web3 and blockchain space. And uh, yeah, that's involved labs and think tanks that also include embodied practices, uh, a lot of collaborative practices and experimental collaborative practices that um, then produced a series of Art World DAO prototypes a couple of years ago and our most recent collaboration with this community of amazing people was on our book, Radical Friends. And the reason a book about Art World DAOs is called Radical Friends is because like in the world of very complex decentralized tech, it's really easy to get kind of carried away by the economics or the speculative opportunities or kind of like just the next wild thing that the tech will allow us to do. And some really awful things can happen when we just follow kind of like uh, the tech innovation. And to avoid kind of like spreading more kind of universalizing and colonializing values we focused on friendship because friendship is a kind of fundamental principle in nearly all societies, well, all societies that we know of. And by focusing on what it takes to support friends across distance and difference, we think we can bring, we can center care, which is both about softness, but it's also about building a kind of fierce resistance to the kind of infrastructures that really tear us apart and tear our communities apart. Um, you asked me a simple question, you got a very long answer. Penny, you should jump in. <laughs> I think that you've laid it out there. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe the only thing that I would perhaps add is that the way that um, myself and Ruth have always approached this space is very much from looking at the way in which the code practices itself, but then also looking at the history of sort of social and political practices. And I think that's also maybe what sometimes sets our thinking apart is the way that we have tried to create a sort of hybrid um, of sort of compatibility between the communities and cultures um, that we actually live and breathe inside um, alongside this um, code and technology that at times may seem at, at sort of um, uh, oppositional to the political parameters that we speak of. And I think that what I've always enjoyed about working with Ruth is the way that we allow ourselves to be uncomfortable and we also 
strive for a, a, a way to navigate the now, um, looking at very real ecologies and how you can never find a total solutionism uh, to that journey. Wow, thank you so much for those uh, very thoughtful answers. Actually, somehow they magically segue perfectly into almost all of the questions that I prepared for you. So this is a quite incredible, magical scenario or a radical friendship that I'm <laughs> noticing <laughs> on my side of the spectrum. So thank you for that. Um, let's start then by, uh, by talking about uh, the concept of radical friendship. Um, so you you meant so let's let's obviously not describe it because uh, Ruth has done it really well. Uh, but you know, in the you both are experts as well in in uh, speculation, not in the sense that you know the groups of people see speculation, but in artistic speculation, world build and world building. And you know, I've even been the spectator, the lucky spectator to some of those um, actions. And I wanted to touch upon uh, r the concept of radical friendship and how to translate it into new worlds, because I think that in the world that Keiken is trying to build, the uh, Necknell world, um, it would be really valuable if we could, you know, translate this pure concept that's based on collaboration and trust to build new inf uh, infrastructure and economies. Why don't? Why not? I think there's um, one thing that always is intrinsic to the foundations of uh, world building and especially when we look at it through the lens of technology and that is to really understand that technology is a social instrument. It is also um, practiced by human exchange and typically lends itself to this sense of belonging, um, which may or may not be kind of, um, uh, I guess, a, a darkness to it. But I think that um, with, with all of these um, new modes of connectivity, and also reimagining how we want to live and how we want to organize and how we want those sort of um, visual and linguistic streams to flow between ourselves and either our local or translocal or global or anonymous communities is this sort of real recognition towards the human being, which I think actually in recent years when we speak about world building, you know, the sort of science fiction of the 70s and the 80s was very much about moving away from the human being. It was very much about um, thinking of the the cyborg or exiting this world. And I think it's quite interesting how spaces and landscapes, um, for that cringeworthy titling such as the metaverse, but it's, it's as if we've actually taken those notions of exiting the world, um, but almost like built them on as a, as, as an extension to this world, like a conservatory or something like that. Um, and what I think is also quite interesting is that, you know, even, even in the sort of facade of the avatar or down to a username, it's less of a cyborgian surgery, but more a state of masked alliance with the very essence of you. 
And I think these are all quite interesting, maybe quite delicate positions when it comes to worlding today. Ruth, do you want to speak? Okay. Oh, lots to think about there, Penny. Um, it makes me um, want to jump onto next que uh, onto a next question, uh, which is uh, one of your worlding, ex one of OMSK's uh, actually worlding experiments that I experienced in the planetarium in Berlin. Um, where, you know, there were indeed avatars, correct me if I'm wrong, of course, uh, you know, sometimes I forget things. There were indeed avatars and there was a journey towards a new galaxy and the whole journey was explained by several beings uh, and, you know, a main narrator that was taking us and it made us transform, you know, the because the, uh, the planetarium, of course, was uh, was dark. And everyone was just sitting, actually semi laying down uh, because it has like uh, reclinable seats. Um, so it's a really nice experience. And looking at the sky, which had an animation, and it was like one was removing uh, from uh, from the from oneself and just like m mutating into an avatar. So um, I would love, you know, I I thought that was a fantastic experiment and a art a artwork as well and a, i would love to talk a little bit about the, this piece in the world and the reflections and the wisdom that it proposes oh um i mean maybe what i can do is outline um what or sort of like lay the landscape of the waxing and uh then maybe also Ruth can jump in um, as as one of the the, tra the travelers on board. Um, so Let's the go. wax the waxing uh, was a work that was sort of engineered by Om Social Club um, that I'm closely affiliated with, and Joey Holder, and it was. Um, commissioned by Cream Cake as part of 3HD Festival here in Berlin. And um, the sort of story or worlding of the waxing was in essence about a nascent starseed brood um, that had swarmed sort of together. And the notion being that sort of every person in society today is sort of faced with this fact that, um, you know, very few of their interests converge with the rest of societal members they inhabit planet Earth with. Um, nor do they necessarily conflict so much that um, there's meaningful patterns or they can then utilize tools to exit or alter these worlds. And sort of in response to this, um, this work was created, but instead of thinking about how to exit Earth, there was this notion about bringing Earth-bound alien beings that um, were incubated and, yeah, I, I love the way that you described it, NP, that they sort of uh, um, mutated or began to form and crystallize inside the body. And actually, the sort of story really thinks about how um, sort of working together, we can splinter different types of culture and what the complexity um, of conjuring this may be. And in a sense, thinking about how networks of autonomous narratives um, sort of straddle um, decentralized ebbs and flows of information. And the work itself was basically um, people entered an airport 
and were transported over a journey that was led by a set of visiting alien beings. And it wasn't the first time that these alien beings had uh, visited. There was um, part of this group um, that were present that night had previously been experimenting with the, the sort of loops of information and the social matrices that had been uh, flowing from this sort of oozing plasma. And so there was some guides to this hyper sigil um, of whilst it was being downloaded. And in a way, the waxing was somehow about channeling personal embodied knowledge and collective hallucinatory fictioning, um, which did of course require a semi-active presence from the viewer or the audience member. Um, but at the same time, it gave a certain set of tasks and tools that honed in on your interpersonal sensitivity and somatic insight so you could render an earthbound alien perception. And I think what was very interesting about this mode was the way that, um, yeah, majority and minority played into it. Um, in a sense, if an, if an alien being or a completely new fabrication allowed was allowed to land on your body, would you accept it or not? And I think there's like certain charismatic moments, whether that be aesthetical or there was brilliant sound scores by Ernst Albrecht Stäbler, who's um, 88 years old, and Dylan Kerr, um, who were sort of the engine of the work. But simultaneously, if you weren't feeling the sort of vibes of the community, I think you'd probably also push back against these earthbound alien hatchings. So it was, I think, a kind of interesting moment that probably propagated a very real <laughs> reaction um, to to the landing of aliens, um, which I think was also extremely interesting in terms of uh, all the research and development done um, around this notion of the alien, which I think also has strong connections to community, belief and language, um, but also simultaneously um, what asking questions about, you know, what and who is understood to be human. So it was also extremely inspired by Octavia Butler's work, but also people like Marge Piercy as well, and sort of um, how sci-fi has often been a kind of catalyst to being able to speak about um, social relations, exclusion, and yeah, I think um, worlds where you where you do not belong. Ruth, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, sorry, I was talking before, but I had my mic switched off. Not very helpful. Um, yeah, what I what I loved about the waxing was how it, how it really kind of played with the tension between uh, otherness and belonging across difference. And the, the kind of, the, the limitations of language, how language lets us down and causes like places really a lot of uh it, may, it we have to make an awful lot of effort to kind of try and understand 
otherness and to find where we sit in relation to it. And this just feels super important at the moment. And it's why I think possibly, uh, actually we haven't talked about this, but maybe this is why both Penny and I are so interested in kind of these participatory, immersive, improvised fictions is because there feels to be like a real sense of urgency around cracking cracking open new imaginaries or into new spaces that kind of extend beyond the conditioning that we're all really constrained by, kind of limited, especially by kind of current economic and pol political and social systems. And so through these uh, participatory kind of immersive environments, we actually get to rehearse and prefigure other worlds by just making kind of these imaginative twists on something that might be a little different. And I think one of the things that like, always the things that make these things land the strongest for me are the quality of uh, the embodied physical experience. So kind of often, especially in the waxing, I felt like the use of language was, it felt very, uh, it felt quite far away. Like you were, you were kind of grasping to, to like make some sense of what the, what this kind of alien, what this alien conception of the world meant and what, what it was trying to do. But there in the room, we had this, we had this amazing pianist playing atonal improvised music accompanied by a young opera singer. And there was just something, this kind of layered, uh, it was just something very moving about the, the multiple generations that sat between these two musicians and their ensemble improvisation that like you could like it felt incredibly true and meaningful and we could feel it in our bodies um yeah that's what I'd like to say about that such a beautiful conversation between you two and I you know I was really in awe of being an spectator to the walk scene and I thought it was a uh, very special and a uh, you know, I I do believe that uh, sort of LARPing uh, or a, a worlding in the context of um, imagining the, you know, different prototypes of either societies or, you know, even tools, everything really is actually a very safe test environment in a world where as you mentioned, rules, uh, technology is letting us down and the, the, the urge to ship and to uh, get tools in the hands of people as fast as possible to pump sort of, you know, the numbers and get astronomical valuations doesn't leave space to understand consequences as well. Um, there's very little philosoph uh, philosophical reflection on blockchain tools. Uh, so I love that you guys are doing this with DAOs and that you have been doing it for a very long time so that there's time enough to see how these tools evolve and these tools uh, and how these tools interact as well in you know different settings. Um, one of the settings is a uh, Black Swan. Oh, sorry, one. Uh, so the tool that, that I'm mentioning is actually Black Swan DAO, um, which has been running for many years now. And yeah, maybe maybe we want to talk about that and how. What are your findings? How and how and yeah, the lessons learned from all of this time that ended up in a book as well. Mm -hmm. Ruiz, do you, do you want to start or? Um, well, I'm very happy. I love talking about Black Swan, but it came from you. So I would ask your permission. <laughs> you, you can definitely talk about Black Swan. I <laughs> thought we could also talk generally about our learnings from so <laughs> Yes. 
<laughs> okay. So I will talk about Black Swan because it is uh, it's the project that is influencing our. It's kind of feeding into and informing uh, our next piece of work together at the Serpentine, um, which I won't say too much about. But it is it is it, the research that underpins it has been super important to thinking about like what we actually want to build. So we've had years of uh, philosophical inquiry, uh, listening to the uncomfortable feelings in our stomachs with a lot of other people, uh, getting excited with a lot of people too about kind of what possibilities seem to be available. But Black Swan Dow, uh, oh, I seem to have turned, uh, sorry, <laughs> the hotel and I've just turned the telly on accidentally. Okay, I've dealt with that. So Black Swan Dow kind of came out of a piece of research that Penny did with a number of other colleagues in Berlin that I think was published in 2017-18. Penny, you can fill in the crediting details if, if we aren't going to supply that another way. But the, the kind of findings of that were that in uh, in often in global cities, and this kind of really resonated with like my first my first kind of forays into blockchain with Furtherfield was that, you know, like the art world and art markets, high art markets like garner huge amount of wealth. But in the world's greatest cities, most artists really struggle to scratch a living. And Penny's research showed, with a with a focus on Berlin, showed that um, the resources were held uh, were held by art venues, art institutions, the funders, and maybe patrons, uh, who would then uh, select select artists from the local artistic cultural ecosystem to platform and give a higher profile to, but that by doing this, very often they were not feeding the local cultural ecosystem. So communities might be left the poorer for having some of their members kind of plucked from them. So the basic model of Black Swan uh, as a DAO is to invite the resource holders in a global city to uh, contribute, to stake, basically, to stake resources in the local arts ecosystem, in the city's art ecosystem, and then for a collective of cultural workers from artists, curators, uh, critics, researchers, to then decide how those resources should be distributed uh, through a system of uh, proposals and voting. And um, this, this, therefore, is a kind of experiment in distribution of both resources, but also agency. It's looking to return life to the ground or to allow life on the ground to flourish and to be determined by communities in places. And um, it also resonated with work that we had started at Furtherfield back in, I think, back in 2018-19 also, uh, looking at how we might uh, enable collective cultural decision-making about the kinds of work that gets, the kinds of cultural work that gets produced in a locality. So we have a project called Culture Stake that we've been developing for a number of years now which is an app that uses quadratic voting on the blockchain. So this is a form of voting that supports a greater expression of feeling. And uh, so people express both their preferences and the intensity of their preferences. And the idea with this was that we could ask the communities that uh, surround where our uh, gallery is based in Finchbury Park in North London, that they would be able to help us select the work that they would like to see commissioned at a larger scale in, uh, in this public space of the park. And by doing this, we discovered that, A, uh, people who don't necessarily see themselves, they don't necessarily see the artist for them, uh, were 
very interested and had amazing reflections on what was valuable to them and their communities in that locality. They really liked to be asked. And as a venue, it was incredibly exciting to be working on a project that we knew was wanted and that was meaningful to the people who were going to encounter the work. So we have, I think we have these kind of, I, I see them as extremely humble, actually, in many ways, but there are these uh, ground experiments in, in kind of grounded deliberation, uh, collective decision making around culture. And culture is a very complex thing to do together. But it, I think it's what both Penny and I have been fascinated with in our Probably it was certainly for me in 20, 27, 28 years of practice as an artist in network, in network environments, like what it means to uh, decide things together, what it means to cooperate, all the different, all the different levels of participation and the excitement and all boredom associated with those kinds of processes. Uh, so it's it's just trying to do close observation of like what we can learn and where that where those learnings might be transferable to other parts of life I guess the last thing just to kind of do a broader strokes moment like the reason quadratic voting blockchain based quadratic voting became so interesting to us at Furtherfield was a kind of post Brexit moment so after a referendum that had a 51% majority against 48%. So 51% were for leaving the EU, 48% uh, voted to remain. Um, as a result of that vote, basically those in the media and with political power were, were able to tell any story they liked about what that meant. So it could be interpreted as a vote for a, a kind of racist vote. It could be interpreted as a vote for escaping centralised power of the neoliberal EU political giant. You know, it was like, so we wanted to explore a system where we would, between ourselves, share a much more nuanced story of what was important to people and what was meaningful and what people valued. Yeah, and maybe just sort of segueing into that as well, I think that um, what is really interesting in terms of discussing these things like within um, the art world is that, you know, some of, and also maybe sort of bringing in why arts and technology is that in a way the art world has become sort of activated as one of the leading protagonists in actually application, worlding, imagineering, and practicing technological innovation. And I think in part this has to do with the, the emergence of new generation of art workers um, who are, of course, raised on intersectional feminism, queer, anti-capitalist, anti-racist and anti-colonial critiques of the historical workplace that they've, in fact, inherited. Um, but I think it's also in part to do with the survival. Um, and this, I think, is also a lot of what um, is situated in the practices of um, Black Swan is this notion of survival, not necessarily only in an unregulated market and playing field, um, which Ruth hinted at, you know, the vast majority of these workers are destined to remain precarious or pushed down. But we've also seen in recent years an explosion of political and social work that is now actually done primarily in the arts. And simultaneously, we have got a huge explosion of radical new mediums in the arts that aren't necessarily brokered so succinctly into the art world that they are given the resources and also the space that's required to develop. 
And I think this is also very much what sort of um, came um, as the initial impetus to think about um, Black Swan was also about trying to create an alternative funding model that allowed practitioners that stood um, adjacent to traditional historical practices um, but didn't necessarily put them inside a space of um, fundraising for themselves, but actually offered resource holders um, a doorway to sort of get in touch with these cultural workers, understand what they need for these new practices, and to sort of interrupt the gift economy and to really support and connect. And I think, you know, in lieu of this, maybe it's also extremely important um, what Kaiken is doing and also uh, what you're doing at Data as well of really brokering new mediums that require not only resources, but they also require archival systems, they require the curators, the carers of the work um, to form new skills and um, hone new tools to be able to translate to the public, to a broader audience, and to also offer criticism and allow these new fictions and art mediums to grow and potentially become um, very useful ideas in, in, a, in a society that may or may not be on a breaking point in terms of how we anticipate future generations to to live and uh, be held in this world. Thank you so much for such thoughtful answers. Um, once again, everything that you say is so interesting that I want to just like interrupt and ask micro questions based on everything, uh, but we only have 50 more minutes. So, I want to take us back to some of what uh, Ruth was mentioning and just acknowledge that there is a very special world beyond the worlds that we already been talking about uh, that is really just truly amazing. It's the world of Finsbury Park, which is an ecosystem of art, nature, and it's truly like a portal. And if I've experienced this, it's truly like a portal to a different art world. And I would love to share some, some of the legend and some of the lore and yeah, the, you know, the institution further field with, with this new audience, because I think, I truly think that this is, you know, a very early world in experiment that takes a place in a park, which is super magical. <laughs> um, that's such a nice way of putting it. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, uh, why don't I try and span 25 years in two minutes? That would be an interesting experiment. So well, you have 14 minutes. <laughs> I know, but I don't think it was. <laughs> I'm sure there are other things. But um, so, yeah, Furtherfield, like, really grew out of uh, my art practice and uh, that of Mark Garrett, who's my also my life partner. So we founded Furtherfield in back in 19, 1996. Oh, my God, such a long time ago. Um, really just as the web was starting kind of like growing as a place that anyone could publish a web page to um, for people who are a lot younger than me it's kind of like really hard to convey how revolutionary and like exciting and all the all the utopian ideas that bloomed with 
the early web, this idea that we could make our own art context anew by connecting laterally with people who shared our sense of adventure and interest in art that actually engaged with social realities, uh, not just kind of commodity. And we were kind of, so we worked together with artists, techies and activists to build the spaces that we wanted and needed in order to collaborate and experiment further with these new network technologies, like technologies that allowed us to really uh, work in real time together across difference also across distance. I mean, that sounds like, oh, yeah, everyone's doing that now. But it was like, it, it, it was really a kind of like, it was like a teleport. It felt as, it felt as kind of strange and sci-fi as that. And also to be working with people who understood uh, the uh, critical, that a kind of, that we needed to be folding in a critical assessment of what these technologies would be doing to relations and power and the way power would flow. So as we were making spaces, we were kind of looking at what they were doing both to us and to the communities and to the kind of politics around us. Um, so making blogs, we, like we made artists blogs before blogs were really a thing uh, and live platforms for media exchange and live mixing and making, for instance, artists open studios where people where you could actually kind of visit people on their desktop and like decide what they what work they should make. Inviting curators from the Whitney to come and visit somebody in their bedroom because it was early enough that this was kind of novel, and therefore you could do these kind of eye watering jumps of kind of from like the art that gets made and is shared to kind of like leading art institutions and to do that with a very strong play, sense of play and mischief, uh, like inspired by situationism and fluxus and da-da. So kind of, yeah, like really quite a heated mix of different art traditions playing with this new network media space. Uh, and I think around 2006, Mark uh, came up with the, he came up with the kind of concept of DIWO. So this was, DIWO stands for Do It With Others. And it's a progression of the kind of punk spirit of DIY, where you make your own tools or make your own instruments and make your own stage and get onto the stage. And if you can play two chords, then that's it. You're a musician and you're making culture and it's important to you and the people around you. And what Daiwo did was kind of like basically said, yes, and we now do, now the tools are part of our kind of, the tools are now part of the band. Uh, but it was also eschewing this idea of the individual genius. So it was kind of saying, we can see now how little sense it makes for us to imagine that there is such a thing as an individual artistic genius. We can see ourselves connected. We can see how ideas and uh, livelinesses are co-created. And this was all kind of bound together with a kind of peer-to-peer -peer and free and open source, open source cultures, which were kind of antagonistic to proprietorial, uh, to pr pr proprietorial economics and proprietorial cultures where you would trade, well, maybe you would trademark or you would not allow people to kind of copy or take your image. This was a kind of, very permissive space where, where for a work to be taken and appropriated and remade and respread and reshared, that was what the work lived for. Um, so I said I'd be two minutes. I'd do 25 years in two minutes. I failed. Okay, so let me jump to 2000, 2007. It's kind of like a little post Daiwo, and suddenly we realised that the web is highly centralised. Uh, 
I'm embarrassed that I didn't see it coming. I should have listened to the smarter people around me who maybe saw it coming earlier. Uh, but here we, so 2007, we find ourselves in a network space, which is no longer a peer and free and open source uh, context and infrastructure but rather those tools have been appropriated by uh, Facebook and then Amazon and Google and the like into these huge kind of mega, mega corps that are taking all of our free creativity and uh, mining it essentially for private profit. And so this, this was kind of like a really hard lesson and I often describe myself as a recovering a web utopian because and that is to kind of describe this kind of shift from the vertiginous experience of kind of like high connectivity with uh lively human beings from all over the world to suddenly understanding that our drive to connect and share with each other was going to be exploited and used against us and now we find like social spaces often very atomizing, extre highly extractive. Uh, we've seen the effects of uh, colonization, the kind of colonizing effects of digital media, like both in terms of finance, but also culture. And um, so like not to depress us all to hell, um, we opened our first gallery in 2004 and then moved into this really beautiful, uh, small but beautiful pavilion in the heart of a public space, uh, public park in London. And here we got to really work with, uh, to kind of experiment with this strange interface that we created in this gallery between the kind of communities of practice of critical media artists thinking about what technology was doing to us and where we could push back and where we could hack and what changes where we could claim agency like like especially around questions of surveillance and privacy and all of these kinds of things so bringing those artists and having them make shows for Sometimes, like about half our audience are art-going audiences who want to want are looking for a particular kind of stimulation, but other others of our gallery goers are essentially uh, users of the park who are coming in and kind of like open to experiencing something new, and so we had to make exhibitions that made sense to this kind of spectrum. And really, in the last five years, we've been kind of uh, flipping our model and working much more closely with our park-based communities because we understand that the lived experience of this kind of like super diverse community, like there's 200 different languages spoken in this park and there's so much to know and understand and share with these, uh, with these different groups of people, like to share out from the park what we learn together and put that back out into network space has kind of become our mission. So like this culminates this year in a, it's kind of, uh, we're in the third year of a three year live action role play about interspecies justice. And uh, this year we'll be hosting an interspecies festival that has been co-devised with uh, growers, drummers, people who work with rewilding the park, uh, working with the local council to kind of like really understand what it would take to reconnect properly with all the, all the kind of different life forms in the park and to support biodiversity for all kinds of reasons that I hope are obvious to everyone. Like why this kind of reconnection of a kind of empathy with more than human life forms is kind of crucial at this moment. That is that is so interesting. Um, <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> uh, but talking actually about species, and we are at the closing of our incredible uh, wisdom seed session. 
Um, I would like to ask you one of the questions that Keiken has been asking the, the speakers. And one of them, is, uh, some of the questions, maybe we make it to some of them. We'll see. Um, so the first one, uh, maybe we start with Penny, um, is if you could insert your consciousness into another species, which would that be? <laughs> um, oh, I don't have, uh, oh, I don't no. know if I want to give anybody my consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> I this is exactly what I've been doing like for the last few years. I've like been spending <laughs> so, so funny. Fun. <laughs> So much time with people doing this kind of imaginative work to do exactly this. Uh, so, like, actually having people um, like bond with different mentor species in the park to learn about what they need and feel like to imagine what it would feel like to live that life. So, my answer to this is that I'd like to know what it feels like to be grass. So, kind of like the hair of the planet. <laughs> I feel like that's the grass grass the kind of rhizomatic nature of grass is kind of like a network it's like the all these kind of network media so it's also quite immobile uh, very various rooted and it's also connected with the kind of insects i'd like to know what it's like to have insects and microbes nibbling at my feet <laughs> That's the total cheat of the question, you know. I understood the question to be, what, where would you insert your consciousness? <laughs> yeah, I inverted it because I kind of don't yeah. think anyone really needs my consciousness. But, yeah. I love this free inter interpretation. And Penny, feel free to answer based on this. I really like it. I mean, I think I would love to to have the sky more inside me. <laughs> and maybe and and maybe vice versa. I would insert my consciousness into the sky. That's a really good answer. And one final question. Just just one final one. Um a book or text to enter uh, to enter into the library of Necknell, the world that Kaken's building. Do you want to go, Penny? Oh, maybe Penny's lost her connection. I'll go quickly. <clears throat> I would definitely Great. enter. I would enter Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, yeah. It's a book that brings together these kind of worlds of contemporary bioscience and indigenous knowledges, knowledges and, cosmo and cosmologies. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely kind of soul wrenching and deeply informative. That sounds like the perfect text to insert in the gallery of a new world that's uh, that's growing and learning. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's it's great. Um, so I guess it's time now and uh, yeah, maybe Penny dropped or she had to go. Um, I'm not aware of her schedule. Uh, um, any, either way, I'm, I'm very grateful for Ruth and for Penny to spend this uh, past hour with me um, sharing their incredible wisdom. Oh, Penny's here. <laughs> okay, let's try the, the question again. Penny, can you hear us? I think she needs to be made a speaker. No, she's a speaker. Uh, Maybe her headphones. Oh, she muted herself. Sorry, it dropped. Penny, yeah, sorry, it dropped out. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, so yeah, we were uh, we we're talking about the book or text that you would like to enter into the library of this new. I mean, Ruth, should we not should we not put radical friends in there? Very good idea. Let's do it. Amazing. I highly recommend the Necknell the <laughs> uh, to learn 
uh, from Radical Friends. It's really a fantastic <laughs> book. Um, it's already in my library. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so thank you so much, Benny and Ruth. This has been super special. I loved everything. I'm going to release on it because the, the amount of knowledge that was shared in, this, uh, in these spaces was remarkable. Um, super grateful. Josh, do you want to close with something? Uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks so much, guys, for speaking. That was an amazing conversation. Um, and yeah, if anyone listening wants to listen back, you can listen on the space and we'll also be releasing a transcript on the necknell.world site. And there may even be a podcast on Spotify where you can listen anytime. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Penny and Ruth. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.